Well, hey, good morning, Redemption Church. Welcome to everyone here in person. Welcome to those who are joining us online. My name is Matt, and I am one of the privileged, or I'm one of the, boy, I screw that up a lot, don't I? I you really, people are going to think I don't know my own name. They're like, this guy doesn't actually know his name. Yeah, my name is Matt, and I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here at Redemption Church. Um, so if you've been around Redemption for any length of time, you know that for the last four weeks or so, we've been in the middle of our series uh, that we're calling Pass the Baton. So we're in this series because our kids' ministry is bursting at the seams. We have literally outgrown completely our space, and I'll be honest, at the rate that you guys keep having babies, I don't see that changing anytime soon. It is, it is crazy. So, you know, there's definitely something in the water. I would not take any water that we offer. Um, but here at Redemption Church, we believe that our most sacred responsibility that we can offer is to pass the baton of faith to the next generation, right? The handing off of what we believe Jesus is and how he transforms lives to the next generation. And that's where this campaign comes in is we have an entire building right next door that we're going to be able to completely remodel, gut it, make it new, and it's going to serve our birth through our pre-K age. Um, now, right after the service, I will say this, uh, we'll have a brief Q&A if you're interested. If you have any questions, myself, Pastor Brandon will be available. We'll answer any questions on the building. So timeline, construction, um, any of those kind of things, we're happy to answer for you guys. You can also grab us, shoot us a text or an email during the week. We're happy to answer those for you. And next Sunday, big, big Sunday, is Commitment Sunday. We are so excited because... Commitment Sunday is where you and your family get the opportunity to bring what you've been praying about. Hopefully this last week, what you've been fasting about. Say, hey, this is what God has laid on our hearts as a family to give towards this campaign. And I do have an exciting update for you this week. Just want to show you guys where we're at. So from a financial standpoint, we are actually 36% of the way there. Woo! Oh, oof, oof. okay, okay. <clears throat> I'm going to need a little bit more from you guys as we keep, keep going throughout the service. It is very exciting. So that is, uh, you're like, you're saying it's exciting. Uh, but this is our staff and our elders who have committed. And then also some people in the church have offered their commitments already as well. But again, next Sunday, Commitment Sunday, it is going to be very exciting. So I want to share, I'm going to put up a picture. I want to share a story with you guys about a young guy who married way out of his league. This guy may look familiar. He has a lot more hair at this point and significantly less pounds. Um, as you can see from my bride, I definitely married up. So, and boy, what I wouldn't give to have some of that hair back now. And I was just chopping it off just like a crazy person. Why would I do that? Uh, beautiful hair. So my wife and I, Tiffany, just to give you a little story about us. We attended the same high school here in Lakeland. We were good friends. We never really, we never dated each other. We were friends and we dated other people. Mostly she dated other people and I stayed her friend throughout that. So, so guys, if you've been friend zoned, let this be an encouragement to you that if you're persistent, God can do all things. Um, so we, we decided after high school, we went off very far to college together. You probably have heard of it. it's Polk State College. Um, 10, 11 miles from where we live. We just wanted to get away from this place. And so on, on this college campus, I came to my senses and I'm like, I'm friends with the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. I need to at least ask her out, right? Like I need to ask this girl out and just see what she'll say. She abandoned all reason and said yes. So we go out on a date and things went well. We quickly started talking about marriage. And then I had to have one of the most difficult talks of my entire life where my now father-in-law had to go ask for the hand in marriage. And he's an intimidating guy, I'm not gonna lie. He's an intimidating guy. And I don't know, you know, we're 20 years into marriage. I think like this past year he turned a corner and he's starting to accept me. Um, so I asked him, you know, can I have your daughter's hand? He again, crazy, he says yes. So I order the ring and, and I, the ring comes in and the day comes to buy the ring. Just to give you an idea of how naive I was at this time, the ring was a couple thousand dollars or so, basically the most money I'd ever seen in my whole life. And so I had saved up this money. I go to the bank to get it. And the cashier gal, she's very nice. She's like counting it out in like hundreds. And so as she counts it, I, 
again, I don't know about money. This is, uh, this is already the most money I've ever seen. And I'm like, do you have anything larger than hundreds? She was like, well, unless you have a time machine, no. And I'm like, okay. She was very kind about it. I'm like, okay. So I have this wad of hundreds. I buy the ring. We go to our special spot, which is the special spot of everyone in Polk County, Anna Marie Island. And <clears throat> we go to Johnny Levrock's. And that doesn't exist anymore. It was a great place. And I propose, and she says, yes. Don't be so shocked, okay? Like, I had some charm in this. Um, I remember what it was like 20 years ago dating. So we, we get married, right? And, and so the point of that is I took every penny that I had, every penny to my name, and I went out and I bought this ring. And I bought this ring for my bride because... I wanted to have something that was outward so that the world could see I am completely and just uh, emphatically devoted to this woman. You see, this relationship had changed everything inside, but I wanted that to translate to the outside. And today what we're talking about is we're talking about generosity. Specifically, we're talking about what does it mean to be generous with our time and with our talent? So I want to give you a definition so we're all on the same page of what generosity is for our purposes today. Generosity is the visible expression of our love for God. Simply put, it's the things we do for God, right? Because when we come into a relationship with Jesus, the first thing that changes is our heart, right? He, he just radically transforms everything on the inside, and then slowly over time, those inside changes become outward changes, right? So we slowly start living out the faith that has transformed us. It's very similar to how my relationship was with my wife, right? In the words of the great uh, marriage expert, Beyonce, I put a ring on it. You guys don't know this, single ladies? It's a fun song, fun song. So <clears throat> I put a ring on it. <laughs> <laughs> because I wanted the world to know I'm devoted to this woman, right? I wanted the world to see that she has changed my life in this relationship, and I want everyone to know about it. And that's what we're talking about today, is when we understand the depths of what King Jesus has done for us, we can't help but show the world. Now, I want to share a story. I want to read a story today about a woman who completely understood this concept of generosity. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 26. I'll have it on the screen for you as well. I'm going to be reading out of the English Standard Version. But we're going to read verses 6 through 13. And I just want to read. You may have heard this story before, but I love this story. Verse 6 of chapter 26 says, Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster, alabaster flask of very expensive ointment. And she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant. And they were saying, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus was aware of this. And he said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always will have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. And in pouring out this ointment on my body, she's done it to prepare me for burial I love this verse. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Boy, I love that. I want to unpack this story a little bit today and how it applies to what we're talking about, generosity. The first thing that we see happening in this verse is, is there's an extravagant worship, right, through generosity, in those first couple of verses, in verses uh, six and seven, so he's at the house of Simon the leper, and this is likely, uh, he's been healed of leprosy, right? It's likely that Jesus has healed him. They wouldn't be hanging out at his house if he still had leprosy. So he's healed, and Jesus is here, and they're reclining. And then verse seven, this woman comes up with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment and pours it on him. Now, there's a few things that are, that are happening here that I want to point out because it's easy to kind of drift to different pieces of this story. But the first is this. This woman is likely not very wealthy. She probably doesn't have a prominent place in society. She's not well known. She's no one special. She's certainly not like a celebrity. She doesn't have a lot of money. She's likely very poor. 
And what we see happening here is she's taking this incredibly valuable asset. To give you an idea, um, an alabaster, uh, what, what she poured on Jesus could have been worth up to a year's wages. That's a lot of money, right? That is a lot of money. And in this moment, as she's sitting with Jesus at the table and she sees what's happening and she, she hears him speak and she's starting to understand the depths of what Jesus has done for her, and the only thing she can do, and I have to believe this is somewhat impulsive, the only thing she can think to do is run to the thing that she holds most precious and offer it to Jesus. Like, Lord, this is what I'm doing for you. This is all I can do. This is all I have. I have this, and I want to offer this to you. It's the most valuable thing I have. But she understands the world says this is the most valuable thing. I know you're the most valuable thing. She's understanding who Jesus is. But again, why would she do this? Well, I believe this was her form of worship. I really do. I believe that she's laying down what the world sees as valuable for the sake of who she sees as valuable in Jesus. She simply did this to Jesus for Jesus. Right? There's no other motivation here. She didn't care about what other people thought. She didn't care about what they were thinking or what they looked uh, you know, on her as, as silly, as wasteful. She didn't care about that. Why? Because generosity is the visible expression of our love for God. She just wanted to show Jesus, I am devoted to you. Right In the same way I wanted to show my wife, I am devoted to you. I'm in. I'm in. No matter what happens, I'm in. Now, when is the last time we would have thought of worship uh, or serving as a form of worship, right? Typically when I say, hey, what do you guys think worship is? We probably get things like music and musicians and there's different songs we sing. We put the lyrics up. Maybe there's some cool lights or whatever. We have a great band We sing songs about Jesus, and then we move on to the other parts of the service, right? But really, everything that we're doing is our form of worship, especially serving. Now, I know when we think about serving, it might seem different because what she gave was this physical item, right? She gave this physical thing, and serving is more of this kind of intangible or intangible thing. Again, this is likely what she had the, uh, the most valuable asset to her name. This is probably the most valuable thing she has, and she offers it for Jesus. So I want to ask uh, a quick question. If I were to poll this room this morning, what would you say is the most valuable asset that you have? And you could shout out some things. This is the interactive portion of the message. Mm. Okay, okay, time. What else? What's that? Home. Uh, Yeah, that's true. Home. The Bible. Oh, good one. Yes. The Bible. My man. Communication. That's good, Javi. Someone in the first service said spouse because they were sitting next to their spouse. That was a win. You guys missed out on that opportunity. Whoever said time, that's what I would agree with, right? Time is the one thing the one thing that we can't get more of. We're all, we all have these 24 hours in a day and we get to spend them however we see fit and it's kind of like this equalizer among people. How often do we take our time and put it in our alabaster box? And do we guard it? And we say, well, I, oof, I can't give my time away. You see, this, this is the most important thing I have. And we're really careful right? We don't just give it out freely. We don't give it out in excess. We kind of hold some back. And very often when we think about it, it's kind of like we want to give just enough, right? It's like, well, hey, I want to serve at church so that I can get that checkbox. So maybe just tell me how much other people are serving and I'll just go a little bit more, right? I'll just do a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. I don't need to be the best guy or gal, right? And it's like, it's this idea that we want to do just enough because I need to hold that back because that's mine. That's mine. The thing that this woman understood 
was what Jesus had actually done for her, right? There's a verse that I wanna read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse nine. It says this, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake, for your sake, he became poor so that you might, uh, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus left the throne in heaven to come down to live in poverty, to live a life that we could never live, to die a death that you and I deserved, and ultimately to be raised from the dead so that we can spend an eternity with him. He did that for us. And this woman here, she understood generosity. She understood the magnitude of that sacrifice. And she understood that when it comes to God's kingdom, he's not concerned about the size of your gift. He's concerned about the size of your sacrifice. That's what matters in the things of the kingdom. If we keep reading in verses eight and nine, I love this because this is so typical of our world today. It says, and when the disciples saw it, who, who these are the guys walking with Jesus, right? These are the guys walking step by step with Jesus every day. When they saw this, they were indignant and they said, why this waste? Why did you waste this? We could have sold this and it would have been a large sum and gave it to the poor. So the next part is we see the disciples rebuke saying, well, what a waste. And doesn't that sound again like something the world would say? What a waste. This oil was worth so much money. We could have sold it. Why would you waste it? on anointing Jesus. Because at the end of the day, is it a bad thing to, to help the poor? Well, no, of course not. It's a great thing. It's, it's a great thing to help widows, to help orphans, to help the people who need it. But Jesus is saying, hey, you're always gonna have the poor. You won't always have me. And what she understands that you don't is the magnitude of the sacrifice that I'm making. So what she has chosen to do is sacrifice the thing that she holds most valuable for the sake of my kingdom. And truthfully, what it comes down to is she was willing to look foolish in the eyes of the world because she knew she was faithful in the eyes of Jesus, right? She looks foolish in the eyes of the world, but she's faithful in the eyes of Jesus, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul says this, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The things of Jesus and his kingdom, they look foolish to the world. Right? If you're talking to someone who doesn't know Jesus, they're going to say, Why in the world would you get up on your only day off to go and serve kids? I see a few kids' t-shirts in here. We had some in the first service. Why would you do that? That's like your day to sleep in. Why would you, we live in Florida, you should go to the beach. You should enjoy the beach, right? Why are you giving your hard-earned money to this campaign? They're a church, like they have plenty of money, right? I thought Jesus owns the cattle on a thousand hill. Maybe you could sell a few head, right? Why would you give your money to this? Because the things that matter to Jesus are not the things that matter to the world. Very often, what we do, what we say, and what we believe as followers of Christ runs counter to what culture says it should, right? These two things don't match up. Now, <clears throat> you might not know this by looking at me, and I understand that, but I am not a great dancer. And I know that sounds crazy. You're like, what? That's crazy. Um, I know, it's crazy. I grew up in Arkansas, so again, that's shocking. You're like, there's a lot of great dancers that come out of Arkansas, I would think. A lot of clogging that happens in South Arkansas, right? So there's not a lot of dancers rising through the ranks in Arkansas. Um, however, however, I have on very few occasions uh, blessed the world with my dancing. Here's what I would say. If you watch Seinfeld and you've ever seen the episode where Elaine dances, that's kind of what I do. It's, it's kind of like a convulsion is what I would say. Like if your whole body was throwing up at once, that's pretty much what I'm doing. And that's what I look, look for. It's like, I just want to be that guy, right? So over the years, I've, I've danced very few times because I don't want to embarrass all, my entire family. 
But very, very early on, when Abby was young, we've done a few daddy-daughter dances over the years, right? And so I, I love these times, hang out with your girls. But when Abby was, was young, the first one that we had, it, it, we went, and it was somewhere in Bartow. I, I didn't like know a lot of people that was going to this one. It was a little weird. It, I said in the first service it was at the courthouse. I don't think it was at the courthouse. That would be weird, um, <laughs> like dancing in between the holding cells. I, I don't think we did that. Um, so we danced somewhere in Bartow. It was a building, I can tell you this, and it was old. Um, so we're dancing, but, but essentially what had happened is it's a daddy-daughter dance, and like nobody's dancing. This thing was dead. It was super dead. And so I'm like, well, let's light this candle. That's where I succeed. Uh, that's where I shine, is making other people feel awkward. So I get my daughter, and we go out, and we start, we start dancing like I'm doing my thing. And I'm rocking it like I'm doing some cool moves right? And she's doing her thing. She's like, this is awesome. Dance with my dad. We're enjoying it. Here's the thing. I didn't care at that moment that I looked foolish in the eyes of the other people who were there because I knew in the eyes of my daughter, I looked faithful. I was showing in that moment, hey, I'm devoted to you. I'm willing to look foolish for you. I'm willing to do something that I know will impact your life in a positive way because I am fully, completely devoted to you. Church, please hear this clearly. We need to stop worrying about what people think and start worrying about what people need. We have to. The world needs Jesus. Every time we turn on our TVs or social media or have conversations, it's staring us in the face. The world needs Jesus, especially our kids. Our kids need Jesus. I've been in this conversation, but I'm so tired of hearing people complain about this next generation, how they don't know how to serve, how they don't know how to be respectful, how they don't know how to follow Jesus, how they don't know how to sit in church, how they don't know how to do this or that or that. But at the end of the day, they do nothing. We need to stop complaining about it and start doing something. We have to, because this is why there is a spiritual battle for the souls of our children that is happening. And when we leave these doors, I assure you, there will be more than one or two or 10 things that try and pull them away from Christ. The only way that we can ensure that generation knows what a life in Jesus is, is to pass the baton this campaign isn't some catchy name we came up with to raise money. It is about the generation that needs to know Jesus. And it's about us taking the, the baton that was handed to us and passing it off. Because if we don't, the baton falls and in it goes our faith. We have to entrust our faith to the next generation. We have to stop talking about things and calling things out and start doing some things that look foolish in the eyes of the world. I want to read verse 13 to you, so skip down with me. In verse 13, it says this. I love how Jesus says this. He says, truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Wow. Wow. Boy, this woman, she left a legacy. How incredible the legacy that she left. The entire world has known about what this woman did because she was irrationally generous. She was willing to give up that which she held closest for that who she knew was the most valuable. You know, I've been thinking, like, I, I think the older you get, you think about your, what your legacy is and your impact, right, and different things. So in your 20s, if you're in your 20s, like the world is your oyster, as they say, right? You're invincible. You can do whatever you want. Your metabolism is still fantastic. Enjoy it right now. Oof, enjoy it. There's like a freight train coming. Um, so just really take advantage is all I can say there. Then you get into your 30s, right? And you start making a little bit better decisions. You start giving a little more thought to things. Maybe you're married, having kids. And, and then like your later 30s come, and that's when... That's when you just wake up and you hurt, but nothing actually happened, 
right? It's like, well, I slept wrong on my tempur pillow and my tempur mattress, and I've had a neck ache for three days. Like, that's me right now. I literally took Excedrin this morning. I'm like, I don't even know what's happening right now, but I'm hurting, and I'm fairly confident nothing physical caused it. Then you hit your 40s. You hit your 40s, and you start seeing friends that you've known. Friends start passing away. Friends, parents start passing away. You start coming to grasp that, hey, not everyone lives forever. Friends are getting sick. They're having health issues. So we start facing our mortality. And in that, we start asking questions. We start asking questions like, well, who am I? Who am I? When I leave this earth, what are people going to remember me for? Here's what I would say. People aren't going to remember your house. It may be a super cool house. They won't remember it. They're not going to remember what kind of car you drove. And again, it could be a fun car. You might be saving the world with your Prius. They're not going to remember the job you had or the fancy title. They won't know about that, how much money you saved, your retirement, or, or the trips that you took. What people remember is they remember how you lived and the lives that you impacted. And if you want to live a life that impacts others, you can't just write a check. You have to get your hands dirty. I wanna take a moment, and this is a little bit different than things I've done before, but I'm gonna ask to bring the lights down here. Take the spotlight off me for a moment, and here's, here's what I wanna say. I want you to imagine something with me this morning. Feel free to close your eyes and, and imagine the stage. Feel free to keep them open and look at me, whatever you feel comfortable with. But here's what I want you to imagine is that instead of me standing here is Jesus. So King Jesus is standing here, and this is after he's been resurrected. So I want you to look at his body closely. And I want you to imagine looking upon his head and his brow and seeing where the crown of thorns was pressed so hard that it made holes in the top. And those, those holes have slowly started to heal, but there's, there's blood that you see. And as you look further down, you see his body, how it's been beaten and torn and bruised and scars are starting to form. You see his back and how it was flayed by by whips and by the beatings that he took. You see the the piercing in his side. And then imagine that he holds out his hands. And as he holds out his hands, you see the nails that went through them. You see a hole in each of his wrists where a nail was driven. And and you see the same on his feet, a, a hole that was made as he was nailed brutally to the cross. And I want you to imagine him looking you directly in the eyes this morning. And as he looks right at you, he says this, he says, I did this all for you. This was all about you. I took all of this because I'm devoted to you. I'm committed to you. And I have a plan for you. And then he asks you, what have you done for me? I want you to reflect on this for a moment. What have you done for me? If if you were to step up from your seat today after the service is over and you, you walk through the lobby and you walk out the front doors and you walk from this life into eternity... I want you to think about that moment and what it looks like. When you get to heaven, is it this exciting, rejoicing party where you get to celebrate the lives that were impacted by the life you led? Do you you share stories with other saints about how you saw people come to Jesus that you never thought would come to Jesus? Do you see the faces of those that you looked into and never thought they would accept him as their savior, but they're in heaven because of those conversations? Do you imagine Jesus saying to you at that moment, well done, well done? Or is this more of a moment of what could have been? 
what I should have done, what opportunities I missed, what time I held back, what talent I wasn't willing to give. The good news is this. There's still time to change. There is still time to change the legacy that you are leaving behind. You can change it. As simply as you have built up to this point, you can build a new one. I want to bring the lights back up. And when you think about your legacy, think about a few things. The first is if you don't know Jesus, say yes to Jesus. Right? We've talked about what he has done for us and the way that we are able to serve the kingdom well is because we had it modeled for us by him coming to serve us first. He took on the, the role and the posture of the ultimate servant to show us, hey guys, this is how you do it. And he did that for you. All we have to do is say yes. So if you don't know Jesus, why not today? The second thing I would encourage you to do is this, is to serve. We have to serve. Again, serving is generosity and it's that visible expression of what Jesus has done for us and it's that love that we're pouring back out for others. There's a few ways you can serve. If you say, how do I do that? You should have gotten a card as you came in this morning. Serving our kids ministry. I assure you this, there's no greater sacrifice that you could make with your time or your talent than to pass the baton of faith and see that next generation of kiddos carry the banner of Jesus and proclaim his name and make it famous. What a blessing it is. You can serve the kids in other ways. We have men in the church who, who mentor young boys who don't have a dad. They show them what it means to be a man, a godly man who lives his life in Christ. There are plenty of kiddos who don't have a mom and a dad to mentor and lead them into that generation of faith. You can fill that gap. We've even had people in this exact building campaign say, hey, I do this. Would that be helpful? Could I offer that to you guys? We said, yes, they're serving that next generation. Even right now, right now, we're one man short for our kids camp this summer. We're one guy short. We need someone to say yes, to spend 72 hours with some kids. I've done it for four years in a row and I'm about ready to retire. Here's what I would say about that. It is the most physically exhausting thing that you can do, probably ever, but it's the most spiritually filling thing you could ever do. It is so sweet to see kiddos pour their hearts out to Jesus. It is one of uh, some of my best memories regarding my faith happen in the presence of those kids. They show us what an unabashed love for Jesus looks like. And it's a special, special thing. But when you do serve and when we give our time and our talent for him, when our motivation is in the right place, we don't ever run out of it. We don't ever run out of that motivation because we're doing it for him and him alone. And then the last thing I would say is we need to consistently put Jesus first. Consistently. I put consistently in front of it for a specific reason because it's not something to do every once in a while, right? It's not like, hey, when it's convenient, I'll serve the church, I'll go, I'll do whatever. Whenever, it, whenever something pops up, uh, you know, I'll go as long as they're not something more important. And I'm gonna be honest and real with you guys. That's something this house, the house of redemption, our church, we have a problem with this. To give you an idea, in the last couple weeks or last four weeks, I had Caleb pull some numbers for me. Only, uh, we had 66% of our kids that had been checked into kids ministry only came one or two times out of the last four. And I want to hear, I want you to hear a couple things clearly, parents. The first is I'm in this struggle with you. I have kids and I understand scheduling's a nightmare. I get it. But here's the thing about discipleship. We are discipling our kiddos directly or indirectly, 24 seven. They're watching what we do. They're watching what we say and they're watching how we spend our time. 
and they're not formed by a one-off, a vacation here or there or something here or there. They're not formed by a one-off, but they are formed by patterns. So if they see us as parents consistently put other things ahead of Jesus, very often what those things are is soccer and football and dance and cheer and baseball and all the other sports. Great things, all great things, but they're not more important than that handing off of our faith to those kids. The kids need Jesus and they need to be taught the ways of Christ at this age because when they become adults, the clock is out on that. Now is the time. Again, I'm putting myself in this conversation, I assure you. In the last few weeks, my wife and I have had this exact conversation. Hey, what does it look like for us to put Christ first in all areas? Because we do have all these things that are pulling for our time and I don't know how to navigate it. But I would encourage you, figure out what needs to happen to be consistent, not for your sake, but for our kids' sake. I really would love to see that 66% drop quite a bit. The thing about sacrifice is this. We read in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. It says, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So a life spent serving the kingdom, it's going to look foolish to the world. It's going to look faithful to Jesus. And boy, it is oh so worth it, right? How sweet is the day when we get to look into the eyes of Jesus and he says, well done, well done. You did what you were supposed to do. You shared the message of faith. You handed off the baton well. You finished the race. Well done, well done.